Okay, this lecture is intended to immediately follow my demonstration where I introduce resonance to you. Specifically, this lecture is intended for Honors Physics AB. Okay, in that demonstration, I used a simple pendulum. We'll consider it to be a simple harmonic oscillator. And by means of rubber bands, I applied an external driving force to that oscillator, resulting in what are called forced oscillations. And then we saw in the demonstration that when the frequency of my hand moving back and forth, what is called a driving frequency, matches up with the natural frequency omega naught of the oscillator itself, large amplitude oscillations then resulted. This is a condition that is known as resonance. We say that the pendulum is resonating and we seek to understand why it does under these conditions. Now, when I describe all this mathematically in just a moment, even though I used a simple pendulum in my demonstration, we'll just mathematically describe it in the context of a mass attached to a spring. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at forced oscillations and I'm going to apply an external driving force, as it's called, to a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, here's how we mathematically describe the driving force that I exert by moving my hand back and forth. Okay, now I am oscillating my hand back and forth, so then therefore there's going to be a cosine term associated with it, where omega here is the frequency of my hand moving back and forth, that's called the driving frequency. Okay, and then the maximum amount of force that I apply is capital F naught. That's basically, for example, the maximum amount of force when I yank on the oscillator like so by means of the rubber bands. Okay, now the driving frequency is distinct from the natural frequency of the oscillator. Okay, recall that the natural frequency is referred to as omega naught. If you're talking about a mass attached to a spring, then it's equal to the square root of k over m. If you're talking about, for example, a simple pendulum, then the natural frequency is the square root of g over l. But mathematically, I'm describing it here in the context of a mass attached to the spring. Okay, once again, this is the natural frequency. Okay, now let's go ahead and apply F equals MA to this situation. When we do, we first of all, of course, have the spring force, but then we also have the driving force, like so, if my hand moving back and forth, this then gives us mass times acceleration. The acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time. Okay, let's go ahead and solve this differential equation. To do so, first of all, take the mass M and move it down to the denominator on the left-hand side of the expression. So, Okay, and now let's note the following. Right here is k over m, which is the natural frequency squared. So let's go ahead and write that in like so. That then gives us this expression here. Okay, now how do we solve this differential equation? Well, let me quote to you what the solution is. The solution to this differential equation is the following position equation. This expression here. Okay, now here's what the various terms are in the expression. Okay, first of all, the position is being described as a cosine. That makes sense. We are, in fact, talking about an oscillator. But notice what the frequency of that cosine is referred to as. It's the driving frequency omega. It's not the natural frequency omega naught. And then the amplitude we refer to here as capital A naught. That's what we're interested in describing. Why is the amplitude of the motion so large, for example, when the driving frequency of my hand omega matches up with the natural frequency omega naught? That's what we seek to understand. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and take derivatives here and plug the second derivative of this expression into my differential equation, and I'll take the equation itself and I'll plug it in here for the position. Let's then see what happens when we do. So let's go ahead and take derivatives. So the first derivative of position with respect to time, that then gives us this. Oops, sine, excuse me. There we go, like so. Okay, let's take a second derivative. Okay, in doing so, that then gives us this. And now let's go ahead on the top board and plug everything in to our differential equation. 
So up here on the top board, I first of all have negative omega naught squared times x, the position, that's this. Okay, then I've got this driving force term here, which does not change. And then I have got the second derivative, this expression here on the right-hand side of the expression. Like so. Okay, let me do some erasing. Okay, now let's simplify here what we have left over. So first of all, the cosine cancels out here, here, and here, but notice what does not cancel out. What does not cancel from the expression is the amplitude A naught. So now let's go ahead and solve for it. So solve for A naught. When we do, we're gonna end up with a function that's in terms of the driving frequency omega. So let's now go ahead and get that function. In order to do so, I'm gonna take this term here and move it to the other side such that it becomes positive. So now here on the left, I've got F naught over M. And now here on the right-hand side is this term which becomes positive like so, and then this negative term here, like so. Let's go ahead and factor out an A naught from each term here on the right. Like so, and then divide the parentheses to the denominator on the other side. That is, like so. Okay, now before I explain what this expression is saying, we actually do one extra step here, and that's to get rid of negative signs. For example, if the driving frequency omega is greater than the natural frequency omega naught, then you end up with a negative number here in the parentheses, which doesn't really mean anything in the context here of the amplitude. So then therefore we do a little trick here mathematically as an extra step to get rid of negative signs. We'll typically see this in textbooks that describe this particular topic. What we're gonna do is take the denominator and square it and then take the square root of it. When we do, we end up with this. Like so. That's typically how you'll see this expression written, describing the amplitude as a function of the driving frequency omega. Okay, now let's go ahead and analyze this expression. We'll do so actually by graphing it out. When we do, we'll understand why the demonstration that you saw involving the simple pendulum worked the way it did, why the amplitude is so large when the two values of omega match up with each other. Okay, now let's go ahead and graph it. All right, so as a function of the driving frequency omega, we have here the amplitude omega naught, and then specifically right here we'll say is this value of omega naught, like so, which that then refers to as the natural frequency. This is capital A naught here as a function of omega on the vertical axis. Okay, now first of all, let's see what happens when the omega of my hand moving back and forth is small. If the omega of my hand moving back and forth is small, like so, as you saw in the demonstration, the amplitude of the motion is small. So then therefore we have a small amplitude that looks, say, something like this in terms of a graph. And then let's take a look and see what happens on the other side of the horizontal axis here. That is when the frequency of my hand moving back and forth is a really large number. So I'm rapidly moving my hand back and forth. And as you saw in the demonstration, basically the pendulum was jiggling around with once again a small amplitude. That is like so. However, take a look and see what happens here with the expression when the omega of my hand moving back and forth matches up with the natural frequency. Notice you end up with zero here in the denominator of the expression when we do, and then therefore the amplitude is undefined. You have an asymptote here on this graph, like so. So then therefore here on the left-hand side of the asymptote, as the driving frequency approaches the natural frequency omega naught, then this results in extremely large amplitude oscillations. And then on the other side of the asymptote, it comes down like so once again, such that you end up with small amplitude oscillations when the driving frequency omega is very large. So this right here was what you were seeing in the demonstration when I was manipulating the rubber band such that the driving frequency of my hand back and forth matched up with the natural frequency omega naught of the oscillator itself. 
resonance occurs. So resonance occurs, these large amplitude oscillations, when omega, the driving frequency of my hand back and forth, matches up with omega naught, the natural frequency of the oscillator. Now, of course, here on this graph, because this is an asymptote, mathematically, technically speaking, you end up with an infinitely large amplitude. That's, of course, however, not what you saw in that demonstration. You saw a finite amplitude. So why is that? Well, if you take damping into account, the differential equation changes, and that also changes the nature here of the amplitude as a function of the driving frequency omega. Without going through all the necessary mathematics, here's what happens when you take damping into account. If we take damping into account, the amplitude is a function of the driving frequency. The function itself, it changes a little bit. It looks like this. Like so, you end up with an extra term here underneath the radical sign in the denominator. That extra term takes damping into account. There's the damping coefficient B. Okay, now this also adjusts the graph that I drew earlier. Basically what it does is it takes the asymptote on that graph and it turns it into a finite sized resonant peak. It looks like this as a graph. Okay, so amplitude A naught as a function of driver and frequency omega. This then gives us a graph that looks like this, like so. And then right here is approximately where the driving frequency is pretty close to the natural frequency omega naught. Not quite, it's not quite exactly the same thing. You'll see this mathematically in one of the example problems in homework, but it's pretty close. When the driving frequency is pretty close to the natural frequency, then you end up with this finite size resonant peak, as it's called, to describe the amplitude of the oscillations. Now, there are really no example problems per se associated with this topic on resonance because resonance itself is just a specific instance of what happens when you force an oscillator but there are a number of demonstrations for me to perform that illustrate this finite sized resonant peak. I'll do so in the subsequent videos.